Hello, everybody, and welcome to a spoiler podcast discussion, uh, loosely based on our former podcast, The Podcast Boys. <laughs> um, I am one of your hosts, Connor Nielsen, and joining me, as always, on his very own channel is the Comics Kid 2099. How are you doing, Comics Kid? I'm doing fantastic. Uh, we are here today to talk about uh, the film Child's Play 2, uh, which has an actress who is in Twin Peaks, Grace Zabriskie. She played Sarah Palmer in Twin Peaks and Twin Peaks The Return, and uh, she was in Child's Play 2. And so Connor and I, we watched both of the first Child's Play movies because you know Connor had never seen them before, and I only recently, in the past few months, I had watched... Uh, the first three Child's Play movies, but we're just going to be talking about mainly the second one. Um, and so uh, I guess I'll just go ahead and do a very brief plot synopsis on both of these. Um, the first movie has a serial killer named uh, Charles Lee Ray. He puts his soul in a doll uh, to try and escape from the cops, and he thinks this will make him immortal, uh, but it backfires because he is able to be harmed and eventually killed. Uh, so in order to prevent that, he has to transfer his soul into the body of the first person that he revealed his secret to, which is this little boy, Andy, uh, who owns him as a doll. And so the whole first movie is uh, Charles Lee Ray, or Chucky, uh, trying to put his soul in in the body of this little kid, Andy, and then seemingly Chucky is destroyed at the end, and then Child's Play 2 opens with the company uh, in order to prove that this doll is not a serial killer in a doll body. They rebuild the doll, and then he escapes and once again tries to put his soul in the body of Andy, who this time he is now in the foster care system. Uh, he's been taken away from his mother, who insists that a doll tried to kill her and her son. And then it's basically the same plot of uh, the first movie, except it's Andy and his foster sister instead of Andy and his mom. Uh, so, uh, Connor, uh, I guess before we start on Child's Play, I was wondering what your thoughts are on slasher films in general. So, slasher movies are something I feel like I missed the boat on, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because I never really watched any horror movies, and by extension, any slasher movies, um, until I was well into my teenage years. Um, I mean, I don't count Psycho as a slasher movie. I don't right. think many people do. <laughs> um but, like, I think my first one was either A Nightmare on Elm Street or the original Friday the 13th. Mm -hmm. And I enjoyed A Nightmare on Elm Street well enough. And I think Friday the 13th sucks my balls. <laughs> it's really bad. And then, so I wasn't really into them. And I, I got more into, like, the – wow, this is going to sound pretentious. I got more into, like, the uh, the German expressionist, like, Nosferatu, <laughs> and, um, the Cabinet of Dr. Caligari style thing. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> that sounds even worse when I say it out loud. Um, but uh, I kind of like that more dreamlike and like nightmares. And I feel like I was born in 1995, so I'm already born after we're what's the term um, deconstructing slasher movies, you know, with like Scream and, and all that. So slashers have never been scary to me, like right. at all. <laughs> and um, and so. When we get to Child's Play, and uh, directed by Spider-Man, and it is a movie that's weird. It kind of knows that you know slasher movies and that you've seen a hundred slasher movies because that's the context of when it's being released. And it's weird <laughs> because it's also being a straight-up slasher movie at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so, I don't know. Slasher movies aren't really my thing. I don't find them scary at all. And they are like the biggest proponent of the never ending scenes of people walking down hallways slowly and then opening a door. And, oh my God, there's nothing. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, it's right behind you. It's like, God, I, if I never see another one of those scenes in my life, I will die a happy. So, and a lot of my least favorite horror tropes kind of pulls of the um, slasher subgenre. And I think that like you have to have a crazy kill for me to actually even like get enjoyment out of it because usually the payoff does not warrant the excessive long drawing out before you get to the kill. Uh, what, what do you think of slasher movies? Uh, well, first of all, I want to say I had to look up the director of the movie to understand your joke. Uh, Tom Holland, a Tom Holland, directed this, so well done for that. I, I was like, what is he talking about? And I looked it up. I was like, <laughs> oh, I get it. Um, I, I think I... I feel like with slasher movies, you can watch, like, two, and it's like, okay, and now I've seen them all. Like, they're very, yeah. very formulaic. Um, I have, you know, just kind of dipped my toes here and there. I've watched a few of the Halloween movies. I've watched 
a few of the Friday the 13th movies. I actually think my favorite of those is probably Jason X, which is where he's brought back in the future on a space station. And, like, I like that because it's so absurd. Um, like, it's just says, screw it, let's just do the stupidest thing we can. And I thought that was hilarious. Um, I think uh, most of them, I feel like you've seen one, you've seen them all. Um, and like you said, it's really people watch them for the crazy kills. Um, you're not, you're like, all the story is pretty much the same. You've got this big hulking dude with some kind of weapon who kills teenagers. And that's basically the plot of most of the ones that I've seen. Um, and so, like you said, this was... Uh, coming in on the end of that era that started, I mean, you know, I guess technically Psycho is kind of kind of one, but not really. It's a good movie, uh, and so uh, that's I wouldn't count that. But like, I would say they're in the runaway success of Halloween. Yeah. Um, similar to how like there's the Blair Witch Project, mm -hmm. which is a huge success, but the big found footage craze didn't really get started until 2009 in Paranormal Activity. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good thought, because I, I would say most people agree that Halloween is where it all started, and that was like late 70s, so um, about 10 years by this point, that we that's when you get most of your glut of Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, all the Halloween movies, all that happens in the span of about 10 years or so. And um, this is just different enough that I think it's at least interesting to look at, but I don't think I would go so far as to say that I don't really think either of these are good movies. Um, getting into the actual child's play. Um, I think there's some interesting concept here. Uh, I appreciate that they at least tried to make a slasher that's considerably different. Um, this is not, you know, someone who's eight feet tall and uh, monosyllabic, if he even talks, and, like, you know, has a, a knife or a machete or something. This isn't like that. Um, but I, I wish it could have done more with the premise that they were going with. Yeah. Um, so our colleague, Rasco, mm -hmm. dear friend of mine, um, he loves the Child's Play movies. He loves Chucky. Um, and I hope he is not listening to this podcast. <laughs> I, don't, I don't hate these movies. Um, I like the first one more. Uh, I think the first one is better. If I just had to give my quick thoughts regarding the first movie. Brad Dourif is awesome. Mm -hmm. It's a fun concept. It suffers from the James Cameronification of, of movies by that point where it never ends <laughs> and it's not even 90 minutes long and it still never ends. Mm -hmm. And then we get child's play, which as you said, is more or less the first movie. Well, it's, it's, it's the second act drawn out to just like five minutes shorter than the first movie. Mm -hmm. And the environments are different. The characters he interacts with are slightly different. Um, there I'm talking about the kid, but it's so repetitive and it became numbing and kind of annoying to me. And it, the movie it reminded me actually most of, it's interesting that we brought up Halloween is the second Halloween movie. The first Halloween two is a movie where it's like they had a bigger budget, but they go overblown. So it kind of keeps largely the same premise or slasher movie that just happens to be a Halloween movie kind of drags its feet. It's just kind of, going through the motions, doing the same scene, same couple of scenes over and over again until you get to the big climax where they draw it out and there's like five endings and then they finally do the thing and then, okay, I guess that was the one that was good enough to kill him and then we're done. Mm -hmm. And so... Same thing here. Um, uh, in, in the span of ten yes. minutes, there are three... Th or two fake-out deaths for Chucky and then one that I guess is the one that actually does it. Yeah, I was watching this on Amazon and... I was like, geez, how much longer is this movie? And they're still fighting Chucky, and it's like there's five minutes left, including credits. I'm like, what on earth? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what are they going to do? <laughs> and then it's like they get him, and then they walk out the building, and it's like, let's go home. Where is home? You know, I don't know. And like, she doesn't even like, finish that line, and the credits are already started. <laughs> um, I think it's okay. It's fine. It's just extremely repetitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think this would work better if you had seen Child's Play in 1988 and then you had never watched it until – and then you watched Child's Play 2 in 1990. Like, you know, that I remember that from two years ago. Now I'm going to watch this movie. But if you are like me and you and we watch Child's Play and then within the span of a week watch Child's Play 2, that's – you're going to be like, wow, this is a lot of the same stuff. And then even in the context of this movie, like you were saying, it's repetitive. Like, 
even if I had only seen the first Child's Play movie two years ago, this one's still, like, you know, having three fake outs in 10 minutes is a little bit, like, I'm just like, okay, I'm looking at my watch, like, let's get to the point here. Um, so, like, even if I hadn't seen the first one in a while, this one is still kind of grinding its gears a little bit towards the end. Yes, and it really reminds me of The Terminator. Yeah. And I, I, I really I was, like... I was expecting Andy to say, uh, you're terminated, but no, uh, <laughs> This is, wait, this is, yeah, this is after the first Terminator, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, so, it, that's what I call, like, the James Cameronification of movies. Is he, I feel like after James Cameron exploded onto the scene, he brought with him the never-ending climax. <laughs> um, which is interesting, because, like, what's interesting about James Cameron is, like, so much of his stories and storytelling are so efficient and to the point until you get to the endings and then they just don't end um and not in like a lord of the rings way uh but in like just in action way like i think terminator 2 is basically a perfect movie until the last 20 minutes where i'm like okay <laughs> and <laughs> but um so i think the one thing that the child's play movies have that is legitimately good is chucky yeah. And it's a good thing to have right because he's basically your draw. Um, Brad Dourif is awesome. <laughs> uh, he's so nutty and insane and he's bananas uh, in the original in the first. So I watched both of these this morning. I had a I had a child's play double feature right before we started recording. And do you know who Brad Dourif looks like? It finally clicked with me. Who? He looks like Tim Robbins' insane brother. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, it, it, I watched the, the Shawshank Redemption a few months back, and there's this... Have you seen Shawshank Redemption? I have not, but I, I, I'm i familiar with uh, Tim Robbins from the... Uh, what I think uh, no one will argue is a bad movie, uh, Howard the Duck. Um, he, he was in that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I've muddled that joke up, but you get what I'm going for. Yeah, but um, there's a scene in, there's a couple scenes in Shawshank Redemption. It's very earnest drama of um, Tim Robbins uh, is like kind of at his end, the end of his rope and his eyes are all bloodshot and he's pale and he's just like losing hope. And at the beginning of Child's Play, you see Brad Dourif running around and he looks just like Andy Dufresne, from, but with like long hair. Um so even before he becomes Chucky, he's just so committed and he's giving it a hundred percent. And there's this weird voodoo element to it that, you know what? In any other movie, I'd be rolling my eyes and thinking you've re like you've jumped the shark. Halfway three through. three minutes into the movie, you've jumped the shark. Yeah. And I think it's just because of Brad Dourif's commitment to it and the way he plays that character is that he's able to make it work as well as it can. Then you get to Chucky, the, the doll, which I think it speaks volumes um, how successful a character he is that I want to give it credit to Brad Dourif as a performance. But he's only doing the voice, and the voice is doing a lot, but the combination of animatronics and little people in suits and... Uh, other special effects through kind of a mishmash of a lot of those. This is a character created by a lot of people. Yeah. And I think they all kind of bring their a game in a way that makes him feel like a character who is being played by Brad Dourif. Mm -hmm. And that, that's not easy. That's not easy at all. Um, uh, he's, he's insane. I like how compulsive he is. I like how, he has no restraint just as a, as a character and he has this need to kill people and he'll just do it constantly, even if it'll like come to bite him in the butt. And, uh, I don't know. I found, I found him to be the best part of these movies. And I think that's a good thing to have as the best part of your movies is the draw is mm -hmm. your killer. Um, I, I co-sign everything you just said about how, like when I watch these, it's easy for me to, to forget that I'm not watching a real living doll. Like when I'm watching this, I don't, I'm not seeing the seams, you know, I'm not thinking, well, that's clearly a puppet that, you know, there's a, there's a hand right there. You know, I'm not thinking about any of that. When I'm watching it, I totally believe that there's a living talking doll 
uh, that's just on set interacting with these humans. Um, it it is very well done as far as the effects there. Um, and uh, I also really like Brad Dorf's performance. Uh, this is not the first time we've seen him in a Twin Peaks adjacent uh, production. We oh, talked, yeah. talked about Dune forever ago, uh, done by David Lynch, and he was... I don't remember his character's name, but he was one of the bad guys with gigantic eyebrows. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, Brad Dourif is doing really good here. Um, I will say, I, I there were points you said about how he has no restraint and he just likes to kill people even when it like hurts him in the end. That did kind of, I, I was, I won't say I had a problem with it, but I thought it was weird how, especially in this movie, like in the first one, it's about halfway into the movie when he finds out from the uh, voodoo guy, like, okay, you have to kill the person you first told your secret to. And he's like, okay, that was Andy. So then he has to go and kill Andy. Um, and so... No, I, no, he has to, he doesn't have to kill him. Yes, right, like... uh, put his soul in him, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Which I guess kills his spirit. I don't know. Um, you're right, uh, not kill him. Um, but uh, from that point on, I feel like even though he is a serial strangler and he has killed many people... I feel like at that point, he needs to be a little more focused on his mission. And in the first one, I think it works. Because once he finds out what he needs to do, he is laser focused. He's going after Andy. Andy is at the police station. And then he has to chase Andy back to his house or at the apartment. And, like, he's fighting uh, Chris Sarandon. And he's fighting the mom and the kid. And, like, that's... But he's still after one thing. In this one, we start with Chucky knows what he needs to do. But we have an entire movie where we have to just kill time. We can't have him succeed in putting his soul in Andy. And so he has to just, we're basically just one long filibuster where he doesn't do what he needs to do. Um, and so to me, it was really weird when he was wasting time. Like, you know, he attacks the other good guy doll and then he buries it run, under the swing. And he does that so that later the foster sister will discover the doll and figure out, oh, that other doll is a living doll. And then like he attacks the teacher at the school um, who else does he? He attacks the guy who, or it kills the guy who worked at the company. Um, and that some of these, it makes sense. Like the guy who worked at the company, you know, he needs him to drive him somewhere so that he can uh, uh, find where, or he uses his car phone to find Andy. Um, but then like the teacher, that one was weird. It felt like that would have worked if, um, if this was a movie where it's like Chucky is Andy's evil side, then that would have been really good. Like, you know, the teacher was really mean to Andy. And then Andy leaves, and then Chucky kills the teacher. Something like that. Okay, um, and that never comes back anyways. Right. Um, um, and it's actually interesting. What you're describing as, like, Andy's evil side, uh, they rebooted Chucky last year with Mark Hamill as the voice of uh, Chucky. I did not know he was in, the, in that. And, uh, I knew they'd rebooted it. I didn't know he was in that, though. He, he's the voice of Chucky. Um, and that's basically how they play it, is that way. Okay. Um, so. and, and in the first one, I guess while we're talking about, like, weird semi-explored premises in the first one if you ignore the scene where brad dourif puts his soul in the doll the movie wants you to think that andy is the one who's who pushed the babysitter out, out the window um like it's it's really playing with this idea of like you know andy is is like a you know creepy kid who's killing people and then you find out later like when she opens the battery box and there's no batteries in there oh it is the doll and it, it really, to me, it felt like they wanted you to second guess, like, is it the kid or is it a doll that's possessed? And then they put, but they put the scene at the beginning where Brad Dourif puts his soul in the doll. So you know already, okay, it's, and obviously we know because there's been a thousand Chucky movies. And so we know that the doll is evil, but watching it with no context in, you know, 1988, it seems like, well, is it the kid or is it the doll? And so like that, I know we're mostly talking about Chuck, Child's Play 2 here, but I did think that was a weird uh, if they wanted us to second guess it and think it was a kid, then they shouldn't have put the scene with live action Brad Dourif at the beginning. Yeah, so that's. But I know we're talking about Child's Play too, but that that's a factor in Child's Play too. Is once you've done the plot where nobody believes me, mm -hmm. don't do it again. Yeah. <laughs> that's what they do. Is it's it's just the nobody believes me, and at this point. The first movie was, I think, playing ambiguously. Or it could be Chucky. Now, we know it's Chucky. Mm -hmm. But having that ambiguity there in the way they tell the story, it's not bad. I didn't think that anyways. It was it was done well enough to where it's in the way they, uh, you know, the shots they choose, the way they play the scene, the, way the actors play it, what they show you, what they don't show you. I knew it was Chucky. Yes, it would be this kid. And if you're saying this is supposed to be a creepy kid, the kid actor wasn't good enough for me to be creeped out by him. But so, but when it's this sequel, you don't even have that 
sleight of hand, that ambiguity, that possibility in your head that maybe, just maybe, they'll pull something out of nowhere and it's a kid. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, They don't have that. It's just nobody believes me. And And look, I get the kid in the first movie behaving the way he does in the second movie. I don't know why he doesn't just his feet and losing his mind it's just it's weird when it's just like all these things start happening and the little i just don't think he's given enough to do and maybe he's not given enough to do because he doesn't quite have that range as a child actor so i agree with you um i think sometimes he's doing the best he can uh and then sometimes it's just not quite good enough and i don't blame the actor i don't even remember the actor's name i i think a lot of child actors uh really struggle with that because you know when you're a kid it's hard to convey real terror when you know that it's fake. Um, and I mean, like when you're an adult, you know, it's fake too, but like you, you know, any adult actor has had years to hone their craft. And so a kid, you know, I I don't blame a kid for like, Oh, well that acting was terrible, but also like, you're not wrong. Like there are times where it's like, yeah, this is one of the weaker elements of the acting. I also feel like in the first movie, they, they mentioned that he's six. Um, he acts like he's four, (laughs) I think. Um, he, he like, I, and I'm, I'm pretty lenient in terms of like how kids act and how old they're supposed to be. I feel like he's acting younger than he is. Mm-hmm. Um, but then in the second one, he, I don't know how much longer the second one even takes place supposedly after the first one, it came out two years later and he looks two years older. Um, but it, it does come across like this is happening pretty shortly after the first movie. And I think he's acting more that age. So, yeah. Um, I will say one thing I did like about this movie is um, his foster sister named Kyle Mm -hmm. um, and their bond and how like it kind of starts off and I was like, oh, no, (laughs) this is not going to be this is going to be rough. But then very shortly after her introductory scene, um, they kind of start bonding. And I liked that. And, you know, she's a teenage girl. And I think what the movie kind of gets right about that, that uh, that character is that um, teenagers have this. They want to be adults, and so they, you know, they kind of want to act all grown up. But at the same time, they're they haven't really been in the world, and they haven't experienced like a lot. Um, and I mean, she is. They say that she's been through like a lot of foster homes, or she's experienced probably more of like kind of the the tragedies of the real world than like you or I had at that point. But mm-hmm. um, but she still is kind of a kid, is what I'm getting at. And so when she is like hanging out with little Andy, um, you kind of see it in like in her performance and in her character that like she enjoys it because she gets to act like a kid. And maybe it's like the only time she's really had that experience. And I like that quite a bit. And um, I feel like even me being able to read into that says something about those two actors and their chemistry and how it's played in the story. Mm-hmm. I uh, I agree with you. I like their bond once it gets there. I did think it was bizarre how fast it got there because when we first introduced her, she's like, you know, the tough talking, like, you know, hey, can't you knock? I'm smoking in here. And then, like, in the very next scene, they're like, she's like, you know, they're running and playing together, like, you know, hey, do you want me to push you on the swing? No, ha ha. Um, and... Well, well, before that, they have the scene in the in the laundry room. Right, right. Um, but it's it, one scene. It is. Yeah, one. and even there, like you get the feeling they're already friends with each other. They're kind of ribbing on each other a little bit. Like, you know, well, you, you can't smoke. You're a kid. Well, you're a kid. You know, like they, they're not like bosom buddies, but they are friendlier. Um, I think it would have worked better if instead of both of them being adopted, if they were still in the foster home and there were a whole bunch of kids and like everyone is mean to Andy and she's like the oldest kid there. And she kind of takes him under her wing because she's been in that situation before. Um, oh, that'd be cool. I like that idea. Yeah, um, because I, I've i now seen – I saw Child's Play 2 a couple months ago, and then I rewatched it again last night for this podcast, and I was thinking both times, like, it's weird how fast they rush their friendship, but I do like their friendship. And I think if they could have just started from there and found an organic reason for these two to be friends, that would have been good. Um, and you had mentioned that the, the foster mom – you recognize her from Logan's Run. I have not seen Logan's Run I recognize her from An American Werewolf in London. Probably a better movie than Logan's Run. <laughs> oh, man. Shots fired. Yeah, um, I, I don't. It's been years since I've seen Logan's Run. I didn't care for it then, but uh, I've heard good things about American Werewolf in London. Uh, it's it's interesting. I saw it. That's one of those first like R-rated movies I watched with like my dad, mm-hmm. and there's a scene where 
he's getting exposition from his dead friend. And that's a whole thing. But it's in a <laughs> porno theater. And like, so there's this porno playing while they're like, he's getting this very dramatic exposition. And I'm like, what is this movie? And it's like, <laughs> it's deliberately like off putting in, 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 but it's supposed to be like off putting in a funny way. And um, I'm like sitting there next to my dad and I'm like, are you sure I'm allowed to be watching this? <laughs> Because, like, my dad never let me watch anything like that. But that was, it was that in First Blood and uh, a couple of other things where my dad just, like, saw some stuff on TV. And he's like, yeah, you want to watch this movie with me? I'm like, yeah, sure. So uh, I haven't seen that in, like, over 10 years now. But um, I was like, I recognize this lady. Where has she been? I'm like, is she from American World in London? You know what I can else? See she, like, she was a in. Nurse oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm like, I'm like I, I think I can recognize her in, like, a nurse's outfit. And then I looked it up after the movie. I'm like, ha-ha, it was. Anyways, you were saying? Uh, I forgot. She was in Captain America uh, Winter Soldier. She was the the woman that Scarlett Johansson is disguised as in the climax. When she pulls off the face mask thing, that's, that's oh, her. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I mean, she looks very different there, but, I mean, older. Um, but, yeah, I... I knew her name from Logan's Run, but I forgot that she was in, you know, it's just a minor role, but she was in Winter Soldier. That's cool. Um, <clears throat> I guess Logan's Run it might be similar to Tron, um, because I recently watched the Tron movies, and that first Tron movie's not good. <laughs> so, uh, we're talking about Child's Play. Yeah. I'm well off the beaten path now. Um, so, um, I, I was thinking, I, I, I felt bad, because I had suggested this, and it had been a few months since I had seen it when I suggested it, and then rewatching it last night, I was like, oh no, Grace Zabriskie only has like four lines of dialogue, and she was like the <laughs> reason that I chose this. Um, I, I was thinking, if this was set in the foster home, she would have had more to do. Or, if you cannot change anything about the movie, I wish that they could have swapped her with the teacher. Because even though the teacher is only in one scene, she at least has more to do in the movie than, the, than Grace Zabriskie's character. Um, yeah, like we remember, like the teacher, she gets like a whole scene, and it's like her scene, mm -hmm. and Grace Zabriskie is in like full on supporting role, and she also ends up dead, but we don't really remember her. Right. Um. I uh. Yeah. So I felt bad when I was like, she's barely in it. I I remembered her being in it a little bit more than that. Um. Incidentally, the teacher, she is a character actor. I've seen her in a bunch of stuff. Um. She was in one episode of Angel. Uh, she was in the Mindy Project, which I've seen like an episode of, uh, and then she's a kind of a recurring actress in a lot of Brian Fuller's TV shows. Uh, she mm. was in uh, Pushing Daisies and Wonder Falls and uh, American Gods, um, so she's like one of his favorites that he comes back to. And so this is one of the earliest yes. things that I've seen with her. Um, so it's kind of I recognized her, but I was like she looks younger, but I did recognize her. One aspect of this movie that I had that I found kind of continually confusing is I don't know how goofy and not seriously I'm supposed to take this movie. Mm -hmm. um, because right off the bat, I think this movie is more... The direction is more assured, I'd say. Um, I like the direction from Spider-Man in, in the first movie. Um, but it is pretty workmanly 80s movie. And I like 80s movies quite a bit. I like the rhythm of them. I like basically the the house style of an 80s movie. Um, the, the efficiency to it. The um, you know just like kind of like all right, we gotta hit these beats. Let's do it. And there's still but there's still some creativity in some of the shot selections and the angles they choose and whatnot. Like there's that bit where it's just a scene where the the cop is leaving the apartment for the first time and they're getting on the um, they're getting on the the elevator mm -hmm. and the way they shoot that is i think it's only one shot but it's it's an interesting shot that you wouldn't do today um and so while i think the second one right off the bat is more assured that opening scene is ridiculous and so i was like okay how am i supposed to take this movie and like because a person gets electrocuted and dies and then you got like, and really everything with the people at the company, which is only that scene and a second scene later on, feels like more goofy and like madcap and like something out of Gremlins or something. Yeah. Than than like a child's play movie, and you have like that one guy who looks like he they couldn't get uh, what's not Donald Glover, uh, who's the guy from uh, Batman and Robin? Uh, oh, uh, Chris O'Donnell. No, no, oh. no, 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 the. Uh, uh, Batman and Robin. He's the guy who pushes. Oh Poison yeah, Ivy. Lionel Luther. Oh crap! It's not Crispin it's, Glover, but John. No, Glover. it's Glover. John Glover. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Um, he's also in Scrooge. Um, yeah, and, but, Gr and Gremlins. Gremlins. Oh no, yeah, Gremlins too. Um, 
<laughs> I'm afraid you'll have to die. <laughs> but he, um, but like, it, it feels like they, they wanted a John Glover, but they couldn't get him. So they got this other guy to play, uh, the, the guy who Chucky kills, but like, there's a scene later on, like where he goes to the liquor store and he's on his car phone talking to his girlfriend mm-hmm. and he says it's like a two week anniversary. <laughs> and I'm like, that's a joke. Like, that's, that's what that is. You know, like there's an inherent absurdism. Like, yes, we got to get the vodka, the fine liquor for our two week anniversary. Mm-hmm. And, uh, that feels in line with like the opening scene where a person gets electrocuted and gets flown through a window and dies. And like all that stuff is like really kind of over the top in a way that's not the rest of the movie. And so I don't know, like right off the bat. And, but then like you have that kind of goofiness with the more like focused direction on we're making like – effectively a slasher movie like the 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 shots they choose are more intense and i think suggest a more um if not scarier movie more suspenseful movie and um i i i don't know (laughs) i don't know it i would i would even go so far as to say every scene with with chucky is like comedic whereas the scenes with andy is supposed to be scary and you know and, and like, point, yeah. especially once uh, Kyle figures out that Chucky is evil, like, but, you know, Brad Dorf, it's like he knows what kind of movie he wants this to be. So he's playing it for dark comedy. And so, like, the the scene with the teacher, he take I don't know if you notice, he takes a basketball pump, sticks it in her stomach, and then, like, somehow shoots her across the room with it. And, like, <laughs> that's ludicrous, but hilarious. And then with the Grace Zabriskie kill... Uh, you're seeing the copy machine is like shooting out pictures of her as she's dying. And even when she's on the floor, it's still shooting out pictures. <laughs> so like those are crazy. Like it, it's supposed to be funny. And I mean, it, your mileage may vary. You know, you may think it's hilarious or you may not like it. Um, you know, we said like, I've, I've had people before we mentioned the Friday the 13th movies uh, and the, you know, with those, I, I once criticized, I think three. Uh, by that point, I just lost all patience with that franchise. This was years ago when like all of those movies were on Netflix, and I watched the first three, and I said, "Nope, I'm done." And someone told me like, "Well, it's not a good movie, but it has some creative kills." And I was thinking like, "I guess that's the only way you can watch these slasher movies." And like that, I think that's very apparent here. Like they're really getting whimsical and like just off the wall, insane with the kills. And then every other point in the movie, it's like, oh, we're back to being a more mundane, almost a psychological thriller when Chucky's yeah. not on screen. And, I mean, I like his one-liners. I like, how's it hanging, Phil? That's my like favorite that line in the movie. And then I, I like the part where he's like, dog on women drivers. <laughs> <laughs> when Kyle's, like, trying to shake him out of the car. Um, I like how Chucky almost has, like, the weight and physical prowess of the grown man he once was, mm-hmm. but just condensed into a two foot tall uh, doll. I think that's pretty funny. I, I don't really know what else to say about this one. <laughs> I don't either. Uh, it's, you know, and I've only seen the first three. You haven't seen any of the others, right? No. Um, the, uh, well, you saw the reboot with Mark Hamill though, right? Yeah. Me and Rasco actually went to go. To go okay. See yeah. And, then and I got to, I got to echo something Rasco said before they even announced that project is if you remake Child's Play, you need to cast Aaron Paul as Chucky. Oh, yeah. Uh, he looks kind of like him. He sounds like him. <laughs> He'd be great. Just lose, like, you just let him loose. I um, mean, Mark Hamill did a fine job. Uh, that movie also has Aubrey Plaza in it. She's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, she's also good in the movie. And then you have um, Brian Tyree Henry, who's a character actor I really, really like. And he's in there as well. Um Rasco hated that. I thought it was all right. And I think that the, the Child's Play reboot is better than the second one. And I don't know. I, I think I like the first, the original one a little bit more, but I give him like the same score. Uh, right. So, And I yeah. can see if he's a big fan of the overall franchise and then they reboot it, I can see where I haven't even seen the reboot, but I can see where someone who's a fan would automatically bring their critical, like, oh no, they're rebooting my, my baby. And then like, you know, it'd have to just really bring its A-game for him to like it, you know? And I, maybe he, he, I'm not saying, you know, that's why he hated it, but I'm saying that could be a factor. Yeah, I think the reason he hated it is because it wasn't like a Chucky movie. Chucky mm-hmm. wasn't Chucky, and that annoyed him. So. Yeah, that's what I've heard from other people. Um, um, so, but I, I was getting, I can't remember what I was, uh, what were you saying? 
Uh, well, you know, Chris Sarandon pr plays a cop in the first one. I thought it was a little weird that he's, like, apparently the mom has been institutionalized because she believes that a doll was trying to kill her. He, Chris Sarandon survived the first movie. Uh, where was his testimony to, like... And his partner was yeah, there. <laughs> both of them could have said, look, I know it sounds crazy, but there's three grown adults here who all believe this. Like, even if you don't believe the kid, at least us three all believe it. Like, there's maybe something here. Um, alternatively, like, I, I'd love to know why she went public with that. Once they believed that Chucky was killed, why would she then go public and say a doll tried to kill us? Um, I'll tell you why. It's because they couldn't get Catherine Hicks back for the sequel. Oh, uh, See, I was wondering, I was like, did she just, like, not want to do it? Or did they, like, say, we're going to go in a different direction and we don't need her character back? Or I wasn't sure. I mean, it's it's very obvious to me <laughs> Catherine Hicks wouldn't come back. So they're like, um, we're, we're going to put you in foster care to your mother's all better now. <laughs> Like, and he, sure, he, said, he says not. at one point, am I ever going to see my mom again? And Ginny Gutter says, of course you will. And I was thinking, no, you won't. <laughs> We're never going to see her again. Um, no, well, I, uh... that depends. Is she going to sign the contract or not? <laughs> um, I also thought, again, like you have to just like jump through some hoops to get us to the point where Chucky is able to start killing people again. Because that's the only reason we make this is for the weird kills. But I thought it was really weird that the company would rebuild a doll uh just to yeah no, that's the... i completely agree and i know you haven't seen the third one but in the third one the the melty stuff that you know they they melted chucky in this one like melted him down and in the third one all of that gets mixed into a new doll and that's how they bring him back and i think that makes a lot more sense and honestly i think they could have just started this movie with that premise where somehow the Chucky that was destroyed gets recycled and somehow his parts get mixed into a new doll and then he's backing at it. Like, I okay. think, go ahead. There's, okay, but this, so, so that reminds me of like the weird like continuity between movies. You're right. The best way to watch this is you watch Child's Play in 1988. You think that was fun. And then in 1990 rolls around. It's like, oh, hey, I remember Child's Play. Let's go see the second one, right? Yeah. Because you have the 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 kid saying like Charles Lee Ray needed to do this whole ritual to put his soul into my body. I don't think he said any of that to him in the first movie. No, I'm sure that may, maybe off screen Chris Sarandon told the mom and she told the kid. I don't know why you would tell your four year old kid that a serial killer wanted to use his soul. Yeah, but it. we got to jump through hoops about that. You know, we have to yeah. like maybe add like like the plot threads that happened after the first movie ended, but it's like, yes, that, what Chucky did, Chucky did tell uh, Andy, he did tell him that like, look, here's the thing. I'm a, like, I'm, I'm Charles Lee Ray. And if you tell anybody about me that I'm, I'm alive, I'm going to kill you. Right. He did actually say all that. But after that, when he goes to the voodoo man, once he finds all that out, I don't think he talks to Andy for the rest of the movie or he's alone with Andy because Andy wants to get away from him because he's in like the hospital at that point. Anyways, but then it's like, you got to go after the heart. And so they shoot his heart. And then in this one, they rebuild Chucky from the head down. It seems. Yeah. They give him a new And so then it's like, okay, like... now I guess it's a brain head thing and they blow up his head. And now you're saying in the third one, they get it mixed in with, I haven't seen the third one, but that just sounds like more, uh, it's, did we say heart? No, 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 we meant brain, head. Uh, did we say head, brain? Uh, well, no, it's, it's his essence. It's like, good night. I'm, who cares? And, yeah, and it's, it's like, here's the thing. Some of the mythos stuff here could have been really interesting, but they felt the need to make a slasher movie again. But, you know, you could have done is, like, start the movie in hell where Charles Lee Ray is talking to the demon overlord who he worships. And then the demon overlord says, okay, I'm going to give you another chance. And just because I have a wicked sense of humor, I'm going to put your body, or put your soul back in another good guy doll. And then that'd like, be hilarious. Yeah, that'd be funny. And like this movie is already going for the weird sense of humor. And like, you didn't have to do the same plot. Like I, I'm just, you know, off the top of my head, there's a number of ways. And I mean, I guess having it be in the foster care system, that that's kind of different um but i think there's so many different ways they could have gone and eventually in the sequels they do eventually you get other dolls like chucky has a wife and they have a kid and then there's like a whole bunch of chucky's and so like eventually i guess they got to the point where they realized 
oh, people don't necessarily want to see the same movie again. Um, and I think that's my problem with a lot of slasher movies, where it's like, it's the same structure, but it's slightly different. Like, this time, instead of kids trying to put together a camp at Crystal Lake, it's people on the other side of Crystal Lake training for camp. Like, you know, it's it's the same movie, but it's just, you know, different. Yeah. Um, and so... Um, Semantics. I, yeah, yeah. Um, but I... Uh, I agree. I guess, you know, we're kind of coming to the point where we're, we're done talking about the movie, but um, I thought the movie was fun, but I it's I wouldn't say that it's something I would have to see again. Yeah, um, it's a slasher movie. Okay. I think it's more fun than, like, Friday the 13th. I've only seen the first Friday the 13th movie. I think it's terrible. It's so bad. It's much more padded than something like this is. But I wouldn't say it's as good as... Not even as good as like the first Halloween, which hot take. The, so I'm just not a slash. Yeah, uh, I and I, I'm gonna echo what I said earlier. Like the you've seen one slasher movie, you've kind of seen them all. Um, I and I think like you could do some cool stuff with the slasher idea. At this point, it's so ingrained in the public conscious, you wouldn't have to follow that formula anymore. You could do something entirely different with a. Uh, there's a comic book called Hack Slash that started, oh, probably early 2000s, and the basic premise of that is this teenage girl goes around killing slasher monsters, and, like, I thought that was a really interesting idea. I haven't read much of the comic, but, like, you can do cool stuff like that with the idea of the slasher without necessarily sticking so stringently to the formula. Yeah, and honestly, like, I was kind of hoping I'd like this slasher, these slasher movies more than the others, because of how nutty I heard it was, but it's not nutty enough for me. I like my favorite horror movies are like the ones that are really crazy. Like I love the people under the stairs as, as we've talked about on this podcast yep. before. That's a good um, one. I like it too. I love the evil dead movies. I like, just... I like how nuts those movies are, you know, like there's, there's this weird, like palpable energy to those. And like the scary parts are the funny parts and they're able to, kind of shock you while they're able to make you laugh mm -hmm. and it's like both of those movies i like i like horror movies that understand that humor and fear probably come from the same place and they try to activate both of those sensors at once um that's um, a, I, oh go ahead that, that, that's a what uh jordan peele he's a director uh you know started out as a comedy guy he was on mad tv uh, no yeah in mad tv i think and then um Crap. Now, was he in Mad TV or was it just Keegan Michael Key in Mad TV? I, have, I mean, I know they were together as Key and Peele. But... Right. Um, it, they, they went on to Key and Peele, and then he did um, Us and what was that? Get Out. Get Out. Yeah. Two very well received horror movies, and he has said that horror and comedy come from the same place, like like you were oh, saying. Um, wow. I feel I feel awesome because yeah. uh, Jordan Peele rocks. Um, I need to rewatch Get Out because that was one of the worst audiences i've ever had in a movie theater um so my enjoyment of that movie was hindered by people talking mm -hmm. uh, but us i thought was awesome and that, that was in my top 10 favorite movies of last year so. yeah um he yeah, but, so no, i agree I, I do like his brand of horror as well um because he kind of understands that like it's fun getting scared. Like there's, there's something fun about that. And that's what I like about us is that like, it's suspenseful and you're biting your nails, but it's also just so entertaining as well. So, yeah. Um, and, uh, he, um, yeah, I think, um, incidentally, you had mentioned the evil dead. I recently rewatched the evil dead for the first time in like 12 years. And I liked it so much more than I did when I was like 18. Um, and incidentally <laughs> last week or, or whenever, not last week, when we were talking about the rise of Skywalker and you said, you know, the Goonies is your is a movie you watch because it's set in Portland and you're from Portland and I couldn't think of any good Tennessee movies. I'm from Tennessee and then I looked it up and like the results were like Walking Tall and uh, the Hannah Montana movie. And I was like, well, <laughs> my my results are slim and picking, but it turns out The Evil Dead is set in Tennessee and I don't know how Google didn't pick up on that. Um, but yeah, that's a I really like The Evil Dead. That's maybe my favorite horror movie. It's it's so fun, right? Like yeah. it's it's awesome and. That that is a movie that comes alive entirely in the direction, mm -hmm. and and just the style of it, and oh, it's so good. Um, we're really <laughs> off the beaten path now. I had a I had another point about horror movies that I like. Oh yeah, but like, I was kind of hoping this would be like that. Um, and it was more Friday the Thirteenth than Evil Dead. Yeah. So. Um, 
I, uh, years ago, um, when I was like just coming out of high school, I had never seen any of these slasher movies, but I had this idea in my mind of like, here's what I would do if you like gave me a billion dollars to make a movie like this. I would, I, I had this idea, like it would be called Hell Squad, and you're going to have like Michael Myers and Jason Voorhees and uh, Charles Lee Ray, and they're all in hell, and the devil says, go back to Earth, and whoever kills the most people can sit at my right side. And I was like, that that's what you do. You then have them all competing, and they're all, like, you build your own little horror cinematic universe. And uh, this was before the days of uh, Iron Man and, you know, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And um, I think they... I don't think that would work. I think that would be just... It'd be like The Expendables, and if you <laughs> like The Expendables, then, you know that's fine i don't think that those are good movies uh but i think it would be like that where it's like let's just you know throw all these horror icons together and that's going to be enough but um you know that that was my uh like early college idea of like this is what you do you like i'm a genius and everyone needs to listen to me i'd read a hell squad comic book yeah um you'd have you'd have leprechaun and uh chucky teaming up mm-hmm they're like we're gonna we're gonna team up and take out more people, and then Chucky screws over Leprechaun. Um, maybe maybe Leprechaun is standing on Chucky's shoulders and they're wearing a trench coat and like you know, and <laughs> then like like, they take it off. It's like surprise! It's two of us. <laughs> um, you'll have Jason Voorhees like trying to like uh, get a girl to come outside the the house, and but he has to, like talk to her on the phone and he can't talk. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> and he can't do it, and and um. So he has to, like, go in the old-fashioned way. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, those are our thoughts on Child's Play 2. Uh, Not my best choice, I don't think. Um, Connor, uh, in continuing our uh, attempts to talk about movies and TV shows that have Twin Peaks alumni in them, do you have a choice for us to talk about sometime in the future? Yeah, we're going to talk about Harley Quinn, right? Or are you just not going to see that? Oh, when does that come out? Friday. (laughs) Oh, uh, I mean, I guess I'll, uh, I guess I'll go watch it. Um, I, I, I won't say I'm excited about it, but I, I, I think it looks about as good as Suicide Squad, but I'll go see it. Um, so yeah, that'll be a movie we're going to talk about. And then, uh, that'll give you a little bit of time if you wanted to think of something, uh, in the Twin Peaks related era. Uh, instantly. No, I got one. Oh, oh, go ahead. Yeah. So, um, a couple days after, uh, Birds of Prey, the Harley Quinn movie comes out, um, uh, is the Oscars. And uh, Laura Dern is nominated for Best Supporting Actress at the Oscars. Um, she is in, well, she's actually in a couple of films nominated for Best Picture this year. Uh, one is Little Women, directed by Greta Gerwig, and the other is Noah Baumbach's Marriage Story, which is funny because Noah Baumbach and Greta Gerwig are a couple. And... Um, so she's nominated for Mary Story, which is on Netflix. And because I am me, I am not going to pick that one. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, if you can, um, you should head out to the theater and watch Little Women. Oh, okay. Because that was my favorite film of 2019. Okay. I'll, uh, I will try to do that. Um... And if you can't, because it's been out for a little while now, we can just wait till it like comes out on uh, Amazon or DVD or something. So I'll just look and see real before we tricking it's still playing at my theater. Um, I, I say to you, I, the only time I can think of a time where a movie wasn't playing at my theater was uh, Snowpiercer, your favorite. Um, <laughs> well, the guy who directed Snowpiercer, Bong Joon Ho, made a film called Parasite that is nominated for Best Picture this year. Yeah. And that movie, is so awesome! Everybody should watch it. It rocks. Yeah, I've heard a lot um, of people saying well, that. Oh, go ahead. Oh, and a lot of people saying what? That uh, they really like Parasite. Yeah, I, I'd only seen one Bong Joon-ho film before. That was Snowpiercer, and I thought that movie was lame, mm-hmm. but I love Parasite. So, uh, And the reason I'm wanting to pick Little Women is because it is a Best Picture nominee, so they're probably keeping it in theaters until, like, for the week after the Oscars as well. So It is not playing at my theater. I, uh, I just Googled, and it's showing, like, uh, it's showing a bunch of like Bad Boys for Life, 1917, Doolittle, Gretel and Hansel. So it's not showing Little Women at my theater. Okay, maybe we can just wait till it hits DVD or something. Good, it yeah. probably won't be too long at that point because it came out on Christmas. So okay. Um, so I've been reading Dune. Uh, okay. We're gonna watch. We're gonna watch that movie when it comes out, right? The 2020 yeah. Dune film. I'm pretty excited about that. 
this is all just an elaborate way to get around a pun that's really lame because they should call that movie Little Fremen. <laughs> I like that. That's good. <laughs> and uh, wait, isn't Timothy Chalamet, isn't he in Little Women? He is, and he's pa- Paul Atreides as well. Yeah, okay. So that, that's perfect. They, if they don't market it as that, that uh, they're doing something wrong. I, I would agree. Um, do, you, um, do you want us to talk about something other than Little Women uh, in the time it, in between now and when it is released? Uh, like out of theaters, or do you want us to just talk about Birds of Prey, and then by the time we get around to doing this, it, it'll probably be Little Women. Um, let's. Do I want you to hate me? Yeah, I do. Okay. <laughs> um, we talked about Brad Dourif. Um, he was in Dune. He was also in David Lynch's next film after Dune called Blue Velvet, which also has Laura Dern and Kyle MacLachlan in it. And we have not talked about Blue Velvet, so let's talk about Blue Velvet. <laughs> All righty. I remember you saying that you said once when we were in the midst of Twin Peaks, you said I would probably hate it, but you wanted me to watch it. So we're going to do it now. Um, I, I will have to get myself psyched up, but uh, we will do it. Um, it will be sometime after the Birds of Prey movie comes out, but we'll uh, hopefully try to get on that a little more regularly. Uh, doing podcasts around the end and the beginning of the year is difficult, but we uh, I'll, I'll let you know whenever I get uh, to watching it. Cool, cool. Right on. All right. Uh, well, with that being said, that is all that we have to say about Child's Play 2, and we'll be back very soon to talk about the uh, uh, Birds of Prey, uh, the Emancipation of Harley Quinn. Is that what it is? Um, so, um, yeah. It's an obnoxious, an, an obnoxious title. It's called uh, Birds of Prey, and then in parentheses, and the Fantabulous Emancipation of One Harley Quinn. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's, um, I'm, you can hear the excitement just dripping from my voice. Um, the uh, Yeah, so we'll talk about that. And then uh, after that, sometime, we'll talk about Blue Velvet. Um, so in the meantime, I'm the Comics Kid 2099. And I'm Connor Nielsen. And we'll see you in the future. Have a good one.